Hey everybody, Jamie Kelly here. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Season 3 of The Approximate Podcast. Be sure to join our Patreon for only $5 a month to see all of Season 3's episodes in full HD video. That's patreon.com slash approximate podcast. If you're already a patron, thank you so much for your support. And to everyone who's tuned in, we love you all. And now, on with the show. <laughs> Kitty! Fucking stop it! God damn it. Fucking cat. Yeah, you. Oi. <laughs> Stick. Scrapple. Stop it. All right, cut. We're done. Fucking cat. God damn it. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Oh my God. What a show we're going to have. Uh, <laughs> everybody, I have Crystal Penn, who is a legend in this industry. Uh, she's my press agent. And I also have Mom, who is my mom, <laughs> who is also and here. And a legend. And a legend. <laughs> Legendary mom. Absolutely. If, if any of y'all like me whatsoever, that's, that's the... <laughs> Uh, first things first, uh, this is going to be a slightly different tone of episode than we've normally done. This is a special one. It's a special one. But right away, uh, we're just going to go in like order of operation here. Crystal, I got to start with you. How are you doing? <laughs> I have not melted, so I'm doing great. And I get to sit next to Mama Kelly, so I feel like I'm having a great day so far. <laughs> Love it. So I'm doing good. Awesome. Uh, you're, uh, from, you're coming from California, right? Yeah, coming from California, originally from Hawaii, and not used to the heat here in Vegas, unfortunately. Mm. I'm very sorry. It, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you for making this treacherous journey. <laughs> no, thank you for having me. I'm trying to contain my sweat to like a little puddle under the carpet. <laughs> She's already, she, you're natural born Vegas. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a lot of our listeners and a lot of people paying attention to this thing, uh, they kind of know who you are by proxy or they've met you in real life but for the uninitiated who is crystal pen what do you do what's your background well first of all i'm very tall in case anyone is curious <laughs> yes i'm extremely tall um i'm groovy's uh, cre creative and editorial director and i've been with the company now for 12 and a half years 12 and a half years yeah i started um i started my own marketing company in 2016 and jamie is one of my my big name clients um and i'm also a therapist actually so i do a little bit of everything because apparently i don't need to sleep <laughs> that's the short version of me <laughs> i sleep for the week exactly <laughs> who needs sleep short version yeah well i love that so i kind of want to <laughs> Sorry. You got it, you got it. Uh, I got the telephone book, too. <laughs> so people can make these jokes. <laughs> so I, I love this, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to expand on certain things. So you, you said a lot. First of all, you're coming from, you're Hawaiian, native-born? Um, from Hawaii, but Japanese-American. Japanese-American? That's where actually Groovy used to have our office. Really? We used to be uh, in like a, a very nondescript office where I think there was a bank perhaps downstairs, and we would be upstairs editing our porn for hours. It probably <laughs> seemed a little sketchy, honestly. Uh. Wow. But we're a reputable business, just in case anyone is asking. Uh, well, Absolutely. you know, they, no, I can attest yeah. to that. Uh -huh. I can attest to that. Oh, yeah. Good times. You know, that's how I can afford these mics. Exactly. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, how did, you, how did you find your way into Groovy? Where did that start? So it's an interesting story because I did not know that my job existed. And technically, when I started Groovy, it didn't exist. But I was having an existential crisis after I kind of didn't quite finish college. And I moved back to Hawaii, which is where I'm from. And I thought, I'm going to write the great American novel. I did, I did not do that. <laughs> and I was taking um, pictures for the local newspaper at nightlife events. And our accountant is um, was doing a, was a part of another event that was being run. And she's like, are you looking for a job? And I was like, yeah, I'm looking for, yeah, I'm looking for a job. I don't have money. <laughs> right. And she's like, you know, um, it's, it's porn. Can you do Photoshop? And I was like, yeah, that's fine. And she's like, what's trans porn? I'm like, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And so I actually originally got hired to do Photoshop. I'm terrible. I'm so <laughs> terrible. And so like when I first got hired for that first day, I Photoshopped out toilet paper from buttholes for eight <laughs> hours. 
I'm very sorry that this is the way you. No, have no, to no, 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 no. Wait, before we go any further, before we go any further, we're all adults here. Moms know what I've been up to for over a decade. Okay. Well over a decade. Um, I think it was like j- just a quick aside. I think it was maybe a year and a half, two years into the business proper when I actually sent mom a very like from the heart and very, um, I don't know, it felt trepidatious to me at the time, but I, I sent her a letter. I knew I needed to let my mom know what I was up to. And just to put a bow on it, we'll get back to what you're saying. But I knew things were essentially going to be okay because the response I got back was, uh, Jamie, you're my kid. I love you. You have a good head on your shoulders. Just be safe. What more can a mom say? What more can a mom ask? And I hope that I've up kept my, like I've held up my end of that bargain, you know, trying to keep a good head on my shoulders, trying my best to be safe, you know? So just, I say all that, say this, mom gets it. So don't, don't be afraid to say anything. I don't <laughs> ask too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave out some of the details of my story. No, <laughs> but but yeah. So as you were saying, yeah. No. I, well, I, before I before I go into my tangential story, I just want to say how how lovely it is that you've been so supportive because I think that that doesn't always happen in our industry. This is a thing that we're going kind of Quentin Tarantino here. I already feel we're going Pulp Fiction. We're going to dive back and forth and in all kinds of different stories that we're about to tell. We will absolutely get back to that. But uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to pause to say that because I think even for myself, when I've had to tell people what I do, I, I think about who I'm going to tell and whether or not I feel like they're one, if they're going to be safe. And two, like, do they really deserve to know this part of me? That's such a big part of me. And yeah. not everyone is, unfortunately. Right. And so I, I'm, I just, I love hearing stories, hearing that all of that stuff comes together. But anyway, about the toilet paper. <laughs> 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 Back to toilet paper. I was not really good at. I, I'm okay at Photoshop. I like. I really should not. That should not have been my job description. But I had to Photoshop out toilet paper for one of the like a photo set for eight hours. And because I was not a proficient Photoshop like short Photoshopper, the buttholes that I had to do, I made them all one color. There was no <laughs> nuance. <laughs> the buttholes. They were ter- They were so terrible. I, I. Anyway, so I did that for eight hours, and then the next day, Stephen, who's the owner of the company, right. was training me to do other things, and he realized that my forte is actually in writing. And he's like, "Oh, don't do Photoshop. Do this instead." And I was like, "Oh, thank God," because <laughs> I would have got fired because my my Photoshop skills not so great. But right away, Stephen had an eye for talent. He's like, "Well, maybe not this, but this." Yeah, and so it was it was really wonderful because at the time when I started, which was I think two thousand maybe that was like two thousand seven or so. Right. Um, blogs were really big. Affiliate blogs were really yep. big, and so I started to do that. And for me, I was like, "Well, I, I think this stuff is interesting, but where am I going to go from here?" And so I was really proactive. Like, if there was an opportunity to learn, or if there was an opportunity to do something that I was interested in, I would just do it. And I I finished my bachelor's degree, which is in a completely unrelated field. And I got a marketing certificate. And because Groovy does so much community work, I was able to carve out a position for myself that feels very congruent to like, I I think my role in the industry. Like technically I do marketing, but I tell people, and I try not to do it around Steven, but I tell him, he knows that I don't care about making money. That's really not my first kind of priority. My first priority really is in what are we doing for the people that we are essentially profiting from, right? right? How can we support community? And and not only that, like, how are we viewed by community, but how can we also support them in a way that is congruent to our company and what we want to do and to, I think, help with the longevity of it? So I've gotten to do something that's marketing, but the type of marketing that I like, Right. Uh, people first person. Yes. Yeah. So I, th- I think I've been very fortunate that way. And because of my position in the industry at a certain point, I thought like mental health is, is very important to me, you know, and, and, and I saw a lot of folks in our community not have resources or come to me in crisis. And I thought this doesn't feel safe to me. Like I, I can provide resources, but it feels like if I knew more, I could do more. And I, I felt like I wanted to use my privilege to support in our community way in a way that I was that felt good to me. So I went to grad school and I I decided to become a therapist. And so now I'm an associate marriage and family therapist who works specifically with LGBTQ people, but also LGBTQ sex workers. 
what's the journey? What's the venture of the becoming getting an, uh, accredited? As a therapist, so it depends on the license. So for me, I'm an associate marriage and family therapist. I also hold a, I don't remember what it stands for. I think it's APCC, which is Associate Professional Clinical Counselor. So I have two licenses. Um, so I had to go to grad school. So I have a master's degree in psychology, which I started my degree. It was like right before the pandemic. And because I work full time, I really could only do one class at a time. And so I think grad school traditionally takes people maybe two years or three years, but it's taken me much longer than that. Um, after I did the schooling part, or actually I did it at the same time. So when I got to the end of my program, some people do all of the schoolwork and then do practicum, which is like an internship. But because uh, apparently I don't like myself, I decided that I was going <laughs> to do the schoolwork and then I was going to do the internship at the same time. Wow. And so while I was doing T-show prep, while I was doing all of the other events and stuff like that. Um, well, I, I Not to interrupt. No, no, no. Super, but... I think like to add weight to the story, like you spin a lot of plates. So to take on this educational endeavor and do all of the other things that you do to make the business part of the business work. I mean, that's, that's amazing. Thanks. How did you find the time? I, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I'm still she trying said to she doesn't sleep. I don't sleep. <laughs> Sleeping's overrated. You know, but I, I got to this point in my career where it felt like the things that I was doing for Groovy kind of was running itself. The tea show grows every year, but also kind of runs itself. There's and a kind of a template that develops, and exactly. all you have to do is plug in the bits. Exactly. And so, you know, there were lulls in my year, and I, I really felt like I. I, I'm not the most privileged person, although, like I said, I'm six feet tall, so there's some privilege there. <laughs> but I knew that I had places of privilege and marginality. Um, you know what I mean? And so I felt like it is my responsibility if I'm going to be in this community, it's, it is it is to serve. You know, and so I felt like mental health is, is the lane that I want to choose to support community. It's something that people have come to me looking for resources for so long, and I, I just wanted to offer them in a way that was safe. That's so 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 beautiful. This is industry. why this is why everybody loves Crystal. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. The, the, at, oh, where's the where's the award for most thoughtful person in the business? <laughs> industry angel. Oh, I like no, that, that one. <laughs> yeah, industry angel. Yeah. I like that one. I tell you, you don't know like here on the front lines where the girls are working and we're meeting each other on sets and going back and forth and doing interview shows and stuff, all the little behind the scenes chatter that we do. And we all agree and we all sing your praises. Your Aww. name always comes up because you're such a substantial part of this business. And I can't emphasize enough how much we all, whether you know it or not, we all love and appreciate you like nobody's business. That, that really means a lot to me because I think like, I don't expect any of that stuff. And I, I really, because I'm so far removed from the front line, so to speak, sure. right? I, I, I always hope that the work that I do kind of trickles outward, you know? But I I, ne I mean, I never know. I'm sure there's people that don't like me. And so, you know what I mean? Like, I think to hear you say that, it makes me feel good about the path that I've chosen to take. The people that don't like you are not the people to like anyways. <laughs> <laughs> right? I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, even people that didn't like Groovy, like, just mm -hmm. because, like, you know, the nature of everything. Totally. Um, yeah, there's always room for controversy yeah. and when drama. We start, Things get very nuanced. When 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 you're brought up, or like when when you know talk about the public relations of Groovy, you're brought up, and it's always just like, oh gosh, yes, never mind. <laughs> we can't. <laughs> Absolutely. I love that, and I think you know it's hard. I think because our company's been in business for so long, and and obviously those who know Stephen know that he's very outspoken. Oh yeah. And yes. so you know he and I have dialogues all the time, you know, and we don't always land on the same page. But I, I hope that what people see at least is that we're having dialogues yeah. at yeah. the very least. Making a progress. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. yeah, I think anybody that's paying attention um, understands that when taking a step back and like watching this huge, like, I'll call it a monolith of a company. For uh, trans adult work, yeah. Groovy seems to be like the Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. you know. I'm in a very particular spot where I've been in this so long. I get to see like the overall like arching story as it's been continuing. And I notice, and people that pay attention notice that over the years, there have been more like conscientious efforts to play nice, to, you know, 
care for like the human part of mm -hmm. this, what can really be a very soul sucking business. Yes. And uh, that has, I mean, that obviously comes from you. That That's your Aww. influence. That's very generous. I don't know if I can take that much credit in that in that regard, but, but thank you. Well, I mean, even if you must have an effect on Steven, he's, he's, yes, he's a very outspoken person. Hey, Steven. He's, <laughs> hey, a, he's a very Steven. outspoken person. <laughs> hey. <laughs> but, but everybody needs a better half. And yeah. I feel like y you temper what could be. Or what might have taken even longer to get to a point where Groovy is really trusted across the spectrum from the work and the kind of pay and the situations that you find yourself in working under the umbrella of Groovy. There's also that understanding that, you know, it's it's not as horrible as yeah, like, no. yeah, yeah. other companies to no, work for can be. And it's so important because it's like, I don't want something just on the front facing side to look good. Like I need mm -hmm. it to be good all the way through. It's not just like virtue signaling. It's actually like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't want, I don't want the work that we do to feel like the community work that we do to feel performative. Yeah. Perf there you, go. you know what I mean? And yeah, I think like for me, and, and part of the reason why I wanted to become a therapist was because I, I don't like putting my name on something that I cannot endorse 110%, especially when it comes to mental health. And so it's like, if I endorse something and something happens and I didn't vet it properly, or I just, I really don't know, like it doesn't feel good to me. And so I, for me, how Groovy has run is kind of the same way, you know, that I want to make sure it kind of, it is transparent all the way through. It, it, it is, it's, it's invested in the equity of our performers all the way through. And so I'm glad that it, it feels that way because it's, it, it's, that's the goal. Yeah, I feel like everything took a, a like a big turn around like 2000, like 15, 2014. That's when we started seeing like a bunch of pro progression in mm -hmm. the industry. I feel like you were behind a lot of that. <laughs> Did you have anything to do with the? Um, and I'm I'm gonna go just a little bit deep for people that don't know behind the scenes business, but. Were did you have any influence, or were you responsible for like the all the name changes for all the little sites that Groovy produces? Yeah, you know, it was conversation that came up, and obviously, we don't just have our collection of websites. We also have the Trans Erotica Awards that had a different name at the time too, and so dialogue about language was coming up quite often. And you know, the the argument that we used to hear back then was like, "It's going to kill our sales." We're going to, and not even just from Groovy, but kind of a oh yeah, that was I, I remember. I was there. Like the yeah. overall vibe was, "You you're going to kill SEO." Yeah. And I, I, I like looking over here at my mom, mom who has no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> but, well, it used to be it used to be folks that enjoyed the kind of entertainment that we create. Um, our little niche, the the tr whole trans thing, it was you'd find it by looking up slurs essentially. Yeah. So it'd be she male and tranny and marketed off a of stigma a lot. Yeah, like, in the early it, days, you know, it was these like words that made people less than human. Mm -hmm. Demeaning. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, like these bar joke punchlines. That's how we were known and how you would search for our wares online. So if you're not searching for those words, what words are you searching for? You yeah. Know, yeah. Who's going to look up something that at the time seemed clinical, like transgender? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Who's going to think to do that? Yeah. But mm -hmm. the change had to be made because it turns out we're people. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it was a it was a large part of it was a contention because yeah. now you're the potential to interrupt the flow of the money uh -huh. by getting rid of all these slurs in order to just Google us. Yeah, that and was a big deal. People hated. No, I'm not going to change the name. I, you know how much it cost me to buy this domain name? Yeah. Well, that was the other thing. Domains were really expensive, mm, yeah. and so there were domains that were slurs, but they were worth, I mean, like thousands and thousands of dollars. And so then, like, what do you do with that? Mm. You know, and, and you didn't have to compromise at all. Yeah, well, you know, when I started in 2007, everything was, di it was a different landscape. And I think at the time, so like for my opinion is that like porn, porn doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so like the social trends that we see kind of in mainstream, like reflect in porn. Absolutely. Right. And so like when I came in and kind of like maybe five, six years into it, there was more like larger LGBTQ acceptance. And there was the beginning of, I think, trans awareness, not even acceptance, mm -hmm. awareness. Yeah. I just want to remark on that a little bit because this has actually come up time and time again. I'm so old that I remember that 2007, 2008 spark of awareness. Mm -hmm. Something was happening. I came in at uh, 2006. It was my first shoot ever for Groovy. But I very distinctly remember we had 
models like Kimber James mm -hmm. and Bailey J come up, and I don't mean to be cynical, but I think my, maybe this is why there was a little bit of a switch over. You can tell by the appearance of like just those two. Um, as Serena Valentina came out at the time, mm -hmm. she went by a different name at that point. They, a lot more, I guess. They like trying to get as like mainstream marketable. Like, well, I they, guess. they, they. Again, this is that cynical part. Yeah, they looked right like yeah. you know classical cisgender girls. They started hormone therapy early, right? You know, and they had that look, and then it just seemed like people now had to take it seriously. Like it wasn't just a bunch of weird freak show cross dressers. Right. Oh, they're oh man, they're making them good. Right. They're making them good. So let's take it seriously. Anymore. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I, I feel like as far as porn goes and how it has any kind of influence, porn is where there was, the lens was larger because all dudes look at porn. Mm -hmm. And they see that. And, and, and these kids, they're coming up in 2007. They're a lot more culturally aware. They're a lot more progressive you know, and they don't want to hide. They they are like saying, no, no, take me seriously. I, in fact, right away, I want to get into mainstream. I want to be an actor. I want to be a musician. You're just going to have to accept me, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I think that's where it started from. There's like these key names mm -hmm. that, I mean, we're a, we're a looks-based species. And that's how you kind of start to take stuff seriously. It, it came from, you know, those few handful of girls' looks. Well, it breaks out of like necessarily more than the niche audience and more into like the, they can cross over to more mainstream audiences. And that's when you get more attention, of course, because more people are paying attention to it. Uh, that uh, is a confluence of that and actually people wanting to stand up for themselves. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. People yeah. have an autonomy. Yeah. Yeah. I did, I did notice that a lot of, a lot more people spoke out and I think kind of where social media was at, at the time, we saw a lot more of that. And so I think of those generations of girls that came out right around the time and that were, that were around even before me or around the same time as me. It's like, it's Domino, Morgan Bailey, Foxy, yeah. you know what I mean? And they Legends. really, they really use their personalities mm -hmm. to help kind of like cross the, the divide right so to speak you know what i mean and so I, we saw a lot more we saw a lot more folks in places where they traditionally wouldn't be like i think about going to like going to avn when i first started in my career and like when they found out what i did or who i work for like people shunned me it was a very weird experience i'm like aren't we all adults working in the same business right right and like i couldn't parse out at the time is am I, is this racism is this homophobia is this mm -hmm. because transphobia because of what i couldn't parse it out many angles right i was like this just doesn't feel good but what i've noticed is that as there's been more awareness and as you know our our genres have all been mixing a little bit it's like the the social capital for our our, our industry has shifted you know what i mean it, it doesn't feel like we are excluded in the same way. Now I have criticism about how that stuff has been handled. And I think kind of people being performative and how they, they support our community. But like, I have noticed a shift at least. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I absolutely have too. And even by the time I got in in 2012, there was already starting to be a shift, mm -hmm. you know, and then like come along 2014, 15, that's when we started seeing all the name changes. And then just like around 17 2017 or whatever that's when like avn started actually like putting our awards on stage and stuff like that yeah a lot of people fighting behind the scenes for that stuff Absolutely. because it was like there was there wasn't any awards before or there was just one award and then it was not called on stage and those sorts of things and so there's a lot of folks steven included myself included and other other allies in the business sector of our industry who you don't normally see, like really like advocating for more inclusion. The unsung heroes. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember those switchovers. I, I mean, I used to get calls from Steven. I remember a, very succinctly uh, a number of emails where he was asking me about what my opinion was mm -hmm. about changing names of like the award show mm -hmm. and changing names about certain websites. And I got to be honest with you. I got to be absolutely honest with you. I was still in the mindset that I thought, now things are much different, but I was at the mindset where like, I got thick skin. I'm not going to let a name hurt me. Right. If it's going to keep making money, who gives a shit? Use it. I, I'm a real person, you know, in my private life. Uh, let's just play make-believe. Why are we going to mess with the words? I was that. I was that. I remember being that. And I didn't have a problem. In fact, I, I remember openly like going, nah, d don't kowtow. Mm -hmm. Steven, you know, let's keep the name that seems to be working. Because even then, 
I didn't find a whole lot of fence in it because I saw it as just entertainment. Mm-hmm. I'd never call myself that in personal life, but I thought, well, there must be a place for that. It's online doing this weird job and you just use that thing and it shouldn't hurt me because I have such a compartmentalized idea of what it is to have a private life and the work life. It never hit me, but as I grew and as I realized that things were a lot more nuanced and that if we keep using those words, the, the, the fans and the, the, like the public awareness of us as people are always going to be tainted by those words. We're not going to ever be able to separate ourselves from the slur. It took me a long time to realize that and not be so business-minded. But yeah, I do remember those like crossover days where even even I was getting like, hey, what what do you think of this, Jamie? There's a lot of discussion, right? I mean, because I think I think because people were on the fence, like on both sides, like you know, cis folks on the business end, like trans folks on the business end, because you could kind of, in some ways, an argument could be made either way. And I think the fear was like, well, what if we're wrong, right? What if we change our whole business model and we're wrong? You know what I mean? And I think porn in some way it's like not the responsibility of porn to educate but ends up being a place where folks see reflection yeah Mm -hmm. right and so we kind of have to toe a very fine line of like well what is our responsibility of in in language then right right and so i think having that dialogue was really helpful because i don't think everyone was on the same like on the same page growth is often painful it is and very uncomfortable yeah (laughs) yeah there's a lot of discourse around it around that time there's a lot of people like, oh, I don't care what you call me as long as you book me. And all people yeah, like, you call me, yeah. that's not nothing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and that actually makes sense yeah. from the performer side because usually this kind of work is like the last resort. Right. And why would yeah. you do anything just from the individual? Yeah, I came from a bad family. Sex work. I have no other options. Sex work of any type. Very hey, survival. Yeah. Right. Hey, w- hey, whatever you're calling that DVD, I'm in. I need that $1,000. Right. You know? So there was a, there was a lot of like just people on the front lines being protective about it. And totally fair, right? Because it's like, what, nobody nobody wants to turn down work. And it's like, right. you know, I think to be a performer, not feeling actually really like you're in a place of privilege to make that decision. Because you're like, well, if I if I turn it down, like what if I don't, what if I want, I don't make any money? Well, what if I'm I get gonna, blacklisted? I'm, what if I, you know? You know? I'm going to be the one that sacrifices everything about me, like, you know, to, to be like righteous. It, right, th- that feeling. It just seems like nobody a wants to be that, the first one to sacrifice. No, absolutely, and it, it, I think it felt like it was a luxury that not everyone could afford. Like, mm-hmm. understandably. Oh, absolutely. Right. You know, I mean, I think being able to turn down work, like it's 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 a very, I think, complex issue. Hey, mom, how you doing? <laughs> I've been sitting up straight for you. Uh, you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask, uh, how how educational has this been for you so far? <laughs> Um, extremely, and, and like I'll have a lot of questions after all of this is over because there are words I'm hearing that I'm not like familiar this with. Would be, and this would that. actually be a very good time to ask those questions on air because, again, everything about this particular episode is is meant to be so like informative and transparent. Mm-hmm. So you can actually act as an avatar for people that have the kind of questions. Okay. And yeah, see, please, by all means, there's nothing that you can say to us that's going to embarrass us. I'm going to embarrass myself. I mean, oh, I no, mean no. I'll, be I'll be the one blushing, but that's okay. Please, uh, I, I'm so curious. We know where you're coming from, the supportive mom as not only a trans supportive mom, but the sex worker supportive mom too. Mm-hmm. So like anything you say can... It's, yeah. It's not safe and brave space. Yes, okay. absolutely. So you were talking about these awards mm-hmm. and I am like concluding, but I'm not sure that all of these awards were a particular kind of porn at one point and then bringing in trans porn. And then you said something about cis something. And I don't know what cis something, you said something about cis something. Well, I, I will I will introduce and then you can elaborate, Crystal. Yes. So the Trans Erotica Awards, it was set up because we had very little representation in like the mainstream. No, like AVN is the biggest award sh- show for adult entertainment. And we were not recognized. In fact, we were outwardly disrespected. We were thought of as the freak show. Okay. So at some point, an independent award ceremony was created through Groovy to highlight and appreciate and like attend to the accomplishments of folks like us. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's still like the AVN's. Expiz. Uh, okay, when you say AVN, 
adult video network. Thank you. Um, okay. And they have a award show that they throw every. And that year. is the big, and that's the that's like the, that's the Oscars. So now you're putting it under one roof. I mean, is that so? Avian was like the Oscars, mm -hmm. and they have categories from different genres. So it would be like main, mostly mainstream, like like I put quotes like straight porn, right? You know, and in the beginning, there there were no categories for trans like erotica. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very underrepresented. If not, there was no representation, honestly. And so. 15 years ago, Steven, who's the, the owner of Groovy, was like, we're going to just make our own. Okay. We're going to do our own. And okay. so it used to be an online competition, and now it is an, it is an award show. But we have uh, multiple categories just for our, our genre. Our genre. Okay. You know, and so there is more categories now at the big one, which is AVN and XBiz. Those are the two big award shows. But they're not going to have as many categories um, because you just don't have time and space for it as ours, just because ours exclusively celebrates like, our industry. Yeah. Right. That's, yeah, okay. that's a very okay. succinct way of putting it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So uh, uh, does that answer at least one of your questions? Yeah. Yeah, it does. What else you got? Uh, so I do. I I have to. St I have to specifically ask about the cis thing. You, okay. you said cis something, and I don't know exactly what that means. It's just the word that we use for people that uh, identify with their gender that they were assigned at birth. You know. Okay. 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 If there's trans, cis is the opposite of trans. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. It comes okay. from the Latin term, which means cis, which means uh, on the side of, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so like basically, born. We don't say born in the wrong body anymore, right? But um, yeah, just uh, people yep. who aren't born with like gender dysphoria or whatever. Gotcha. Okay. That's a good one to ask. Yeah, that really is a good one. Absolutely. There's a lot of folks that see it as a slight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you put uh, an asterisk by what they consider to be normal, normal, yeah. then they feel now all of a sudden they feel what it's like to be othered. Yeah. You know? Gotcha. Like, don't I'm not cis. I'm just normal. Don't don't put a don't put a thing on my thing. <laughs> <laughs> they fell into the victim role really fast. Right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's <sucks. laughs> <Something> real salty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see I didn't even know there was a controversy actually yeah. except yeah. that you had kind of kind of alluded to that when you were talking about these awards. In the real like in day, like when I go out grocery shopping, it's not a hassle, but very vocal and angry you know, minorities online make a big deal out of that prefix. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. It's hard, right? Language is subjective and it's contextual and it changes over time, right? So it's like what yeah. we're using in terms of vernacular 20 years ago, 30 years ago has is, is, is shifted greatly. Evolution, right? right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chris, I got to ask, how new is your accreditation to like, I guess, practice medicine? Is that a... I wish I was that smart. No, I'm not that smart. I can do talk therapy, so I can't prescribe. I can't prescribe uh, medication to anybody. Um, I I actually just got licensed in. I know, right? Thank you. I say congratulations. I know, right? <laughs> I felt very celebrated just then. Um, I got licensed in April, but I had to do. I had to uh, fulfill a certain number of hours seeing clients actually prior to doing that. So so even though I'm, I'm technically licensed since April, I've been seeing clients for I think about a year and a half having that actual practice has it like does it feel like even more of a calling or is there things that you're learning about doing the work that you're like what did I get myself into I kind of you know I, I people ask me this all the time I, I was talking to my mom the other day and she was asking me about being a therapist and she's like is it really difficult for you? Because she was like, you were really sensitive as a kid and you were really worried about other people. And I said, you know, funny enough, it, it's actually made things a lot easier for me because when you're a therapist, there's a very clear structure and framework. And I know what is my responsibility versus somebody else's. Whereas like, if I'm like a little five-year-old in my family, I'm like worried about everybody, right? And mm -hmm. so like being a therapist has provided a structure, structure that's been very important. And I find that it's like, it's like not the only thing I'm interested in. And so I, I, I probably will never be a therapist that only sees clients. I think I will always do community work. I will always do marketing because those are parts of my personality that feel very integral to who I am. Right. But like I have, I do, I have about 10 clients right now. And then, like I said, I've been doing letters of support for, so for folks that are looking for submitting to insurance for transition related services, I do that process because I feel like it's stressful for folks. Um, I, I price it very low or it's free and you know, just to just to make that part accessible. But, but, right. you know, I think doing that kind of work, 
I don't know. It's been very, this seems kind of, this is like a strange way to put it because I have to sit with a lot of trauma. It, it, it is very joyous. Like I feel really privileged that people want to sit with me and want me to process with them and hold safe space for them. I feel like it's what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe not 24 seven because that's a lot, but like in the little container that I've created, it feels very. It feels right. Yeah. It feels very right. It feels very natural. You know, I, when I, I started at the center doing my, my internship, you know, everybody was really worried, like, because I we, I started with other people, and they were talking about their stress, and they're talking about their stress about what if the client's in crisis, or what if they're suicidal, and I, and I said, you know, I've, one, I'm older. I know you thought I was really young. I'm very ancient, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like... <laughs> we're all part of the sad, but rad club. <laughs> Crystal is tall and young, okay? That's right. I'm like six feet tall, and I'm 21. Yeah. yeah, okay. Well, thank you. I'll take that. But yeah, you know, I think like, because I'm older I and because I've been in this community so long, I've been around a lot of crisis. So, like, I'm not afraid of people's scary feelings. I'm not afraid of sitting with what that is. And so it, it had really poised me, I think, to be a therapist working in these communities specifically. So you were doing this, though, kind of, it must have started in 2021 when you started seeing people mm -hmm. during kind of the height of the pandemic. Yes. So were you seeing them face to face or were you seeing them? Just on, yeah, them and just online, you know. Yeah. So I actually I did my um I did my practicum at the LGBTQ Center in Orange County, and I never I've never gone I've never set foot in there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've never set foot in there because everyone was doing telehealth, and eventually we kind of opened up. And I know I know therapists now are doing in person stuff. I'm I'm not. You know, my clients are all over the place, and gas is expensive for them. You know, and so. Being on telehealth, you know, a lot of them will like go to their car and they'll just pop their phone on and then we'll do right. session that way. So I think it makes things very accessible. Yeah. I'm going to switch gears a little bit, but actually not too far. One of the reasons I wanted to have my mom on is because this is essentially production date episode 17 of the podcast. And we have heard so many stories from so many performers, many, many of them, if not the grand majority, trans. Yes, more um, often than not. More often than not. And hearing everybody's like, because it always tends to come up, people's stories of their family and their upbringing. We've heard a lot of stories. And heard it supportive seems, parents. We've heard banning parents. We've heard, we've heard a lot of um, not so great stories. Yeah. And it seems to be that that is like the case more often than not, oh, yeah. unfortunately, Absolutely. even in 2023. And I wanted to have my mom on because I know that so many of our listeners are either like, they're just trans folks at all. We just have reach, you know, uh, as far as like what we do for a living and mm -hmm. how, you know, how people connect online. Sure. We have reach for just those folks. And we also, you know, we have people that are getting into the industry and, I think it'd be really important to kind of share, um, because I'm very old, uh, what, <laughs> what growth. Not, don't, <laughs> don't. You seen her face. <laughs> don't. <laughs> what, what growth can look like from like humble beginnings and maybe not such a great start to where somebody like me can have my mom on the podcast and we're the best friends in the world because we we had that much time to grow and that maybe if you're in not such a great position in growth, maybe this is a way to provide a little hope and show you that it, it can get better and kind of share what growth feels like, at least within our story. So uh, here's your time to shine, mom. I'm going to put you on the spot. Come up to the mic. I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. When I I'll, knew it. I'll, 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 we'll softball you. <laughs> you're going to we'll softball you first. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I want to know, like, because I, I can't see myself from the outside looking in. So I don't know what you saw as I was growing up, but were there any kind of early indications that something was different? Okay. So I attributed everything that was to being a cancer. <laughs> ah. I mean, I, I was looking at it that way. Okay. He's, he's, he's a cancer. <laughs> um, it wasn't until... And I think I thought it was Joey doing it, but I think you told me later. For the it purposes was you. of the story, that's my younger brother. Yeah, uh, I would find like um, 
lipstick, you know, kissy lips, you know, how moms blot their <laughs> yeah. lipstick. I would find kissy lips in the trash can and, uh, you know, I did this. You know, I, I didn't use paper. <laughs> <laughs> and on the mirror, things like that. And I thought, I thought that was your, I thought that was your brother. Really? I never would have, I never would have imagined. Wow. Because, <laughs> because Joey's like a little bit on the vein side. And oh. kind of like Joey, Joey <laughs> thought he was, you know, kind of, kind of pretty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but then late, yeah, later, by the time you got to your, like, you know, teens, I guess, early teens. I was about to say, like, I can only imagine how I made it, like, when I was aware that it was becoming a parent. And I, it was just right around the time of puberty. It must have been, like, 13 where I noticed me being very, like, explicit about at least experimenting with gender expression. I remember uh, being uh, like 13 and like starting to cut off jeans and make little short shorts. Mm -hmm. You got theatrical about it. That yeah. was the other thing. And you would always say it was rock and roll. <laughs> that's that's the thing. That's very important. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, because this was, I mean, this was the mid to late 90s mm -hmm. when I was in my, you know, my fledgling teens. I, I turned 13 and... 1993, 1992, mm -hmm. and there was nothing. There was nothing to feel weird and have there were no no internet, no sense of community, and the only thing that you ever saw that was like twisted transgressive sister. was stuff like Twisted Sister or like maybe RuPaul. You yeah, know? that's it. Those were the only cultural touchstones of, about what it is to like be in flux with gender. So I kept all that stuff. A lot of experimentation, I would leave clues around. I wasn't careful about it because I also had this like very strong sense of independence. And I think that comes from being like a, a you know, that late 80s, early 90s latchkey kid. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, Tough. the parents were at work. Yes. I had to walk, I, you know, I was allowed to stay out until all hours of the night, until the, you know, until the, the street lights came on. You know, I was oh, able until to go. This, yeah, okay. And I was able to, like, I had to I walk myself home, and and I had a key to the house, and waited for parents to come home. I was like, that's our generation. It's just our generation. Yeah. That, that was just folks had to work. What do you get to do? You get to give them a key. You get to tell them, yeah, hey, don't talk to strangers. That's what. What else can you mm -hmm. do? So right away, just just by the very culture and the zeitgeist of the time, I was like bred to have an independent kind of mindset. So that also played into me being, I mean, a little bit careful about, you know, who sees the gender expression, but absolutely not being afraid to express. So I think, you know, that's if, if I don't know if me saying that helps you out or how you saw I, things. It, well, it, it does like make sense. So there's during that time, I mean, I was a pretty young parent. Yeah. But I thought, okay, they've got to have independent, they've got to be able to take care of themselves, but I have to control everything. Ah. And so you struck back a lot. I did. I was, <laughs> you were a striker backer. <laughs> I was very independent. I was very independent. Uh -huh. And I, I wanted to be able to do things my way because although I was scared to like the, the things that like, People going through puberty scare, like I, oh, I got too shy to talk to girls. But you but always anything, had anything that was in, yeah. But anything that was internal in me, that I could deal with. I always said I was like made out of middle finger. I'll do whatever I want to myself. I'll use, <laughs> I will use myself as a laboratory. And if anybody sees it, I just, I'm just all middle fingers. <laughs> I don't give a shit. I'll do it. Um, very big aversion to authority there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a chip on my shoulder. I was very authority adverse. <laughs> Is it being like the firstborn kid? Yeah, well, it, yeah no, might not, have something to do with it. Mm, yeah, a bit, a little bit. Uh, again, mom, mom, you know, she was a young mother, and so like I, I feel if this is a fair thing to say, please tell me otherwise. But when you're young and you have four kids, you know, all the experimentation has to be done on the first kid. Oh yes, and it gets better and better. <laughs> Maybe. Until the last I don't know that I did well. I mean, until you guys grew up. But I 
do think there was a lot of trauma, especially in your childhood and Joey's childhood, because I moved every six months. Because yeah. because every six months, I would sign a six-month lease, then the rent would go up, and I'd go find another six-month lease. There was a lot of moving around. There yeah, was a it, lot of insecurity. And it was just We like, didn't have a lot of, of support. Course. And it, also, you add in the fact that m- maybe not like the uh, the best father figures, right? Not it. So you, you know, young mom, a lot of moving around because you got to chase money to keep, you know, food in the bellies. And then also the additional trauma of not having like great father figures on top of it, uh, it becomes very chaotic. Mm -hmm. You know, it lends itself to chaos. I remember it took me a long time and I'm going to jump back to where you said I always blamed it on rock and roll because that's, I did find when all my like internal experimentation like just needed to manifest, it turns out I was also a musician. And if you're a musician and you play rock and roll music, you can blame any look on I'm in a band. You can walk on stage oh, yes. in a diaper and you so did, I think. You can walk yeah. around in shiny pants and crop tops. Absolutely. And yeah. put your hair in a, in a high ponytail. And all the makeup. And all the yeah. makeup. And mm-hmm. hey, look, that's, I'm, I'm in a band, man. <laughs> you know, I'm a musician. It still happens to this day. People that are experimenting with the their gender and just trying to find out what everything means, that whole goth thing is like, that's your safe card. Oh, it's the best. <laughs> I never, I didn't hear Bauhaus until I was 33 years old. But I was always going under, well, no, nah, I'm just goth, OG goth. My favorite bands, they might be giants. I don't, I don't listen to goth. I don't know nothing ben about Fultz. the goth culture. But if you put on enough black, you can start to put on makeup and nobody will question you. Hey, makeup plus a collar? Oh, that's a subgenre. That's a subculture. Mm-hmm. But all the while, it was actually me doing what I could to express my gender without getting beat up all the time. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because, like, for me, being mass presenting in the '90s is that it wasn't goth that I could kind of you know be safe in. It was actually alternative and grunge, just mm-hmm. because it was the oversized mm-hmm. jeans and the flannel, which I and beanie I, and, and the that. beanies, right? I mean, I still wear flannels now, but it felt like yeah. you could be safely masculine and it was more socially acceptable nobody questioned my outfits then right or did did it last i gotta ask you mom um in this journey of you know coming up trans i remember very specifically making a facebook post and i think this was like 2011 i think this is when i took it upon myself without telling anybody i started to do gray market hrt the hormone therapy didn't have a doctor, didn't have an endocrinologist. In Texas, there's no trans-friendly thing. And the one endocrinologist that we had in North Texas, the client list, was, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't get on the waiting list, you know? So I just did my own research. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I found essentially the things that would start me on that chemical part of the journey. I was about a few months into it, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'm already, I'm already ingesting the pills. I'm already starting to, you know, shoot myself up with stuff. I had to make a public announcement. And I remember when I made that public announcement, it was like through Facebook, when I was using Facebook. It's been many, many years since I've used Facebook. <laughs> I just want everybody to be sure about that. Um, <laughs> but when I officially came out, uh, what were your feelings? Because I remember the day that I had to, that I showed up at your house for it might have been Christmas or a birthday or something, but I was fully dressed and I came just rocking full femininity. I had already made the post. What was it like to open the door and see your kid not quite like your kid anymore? But I think you must have given me fair warning or something. Well, I made that I, Facebook I, post yeah. and every, the whole family was on it at the time. So I just imagine when I made the post, everybody that mattered would see it. Uh-huh. Honestly, I, I I already knew what your decision was. You had already told me you were taking shots and things like that. I I think you had brought them to the house. What are you going to do? You're going to lose your your child? You're this gonna, is this gonna, is the thing that's interesting to me because your love for your kid outweighed. But it must have been weird because I I there was that weird tension in the room. There was a weird tension, but there was a. I mean, it's kind of like. There's a process, a kind of a grieving, because when mm. your child is born, 
You see them as absolutely beautiful and perfect in every way. And for that beautiful, perfect person to not see themselves as beautiful and perfect and like not like what they see, it, it hurts. I, there's a piece of you that feels like, you know, you don't want your kid to feel like that. And then you know that whatever life they choose, it could be lonely or it could be dangerous Right. Or it could be, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to come to terms with. And ultimately, like, no, my parents couldn't tell me how to live. They couldn't stop me from doing anything I wanted to do. Anything that I made up my mind to do, I was going to do it. And they didn't hate me for it. And they still supported me when I needed them. They were all, they had my back, even if we couldn't agree on a many, many things. They had my back. I'm going to do the very least I'm going to do is that for my own. Because they've all got their own, you know, they've got their own things. Flavors, yeah. They've got their own flavors. They've got their own, you know, things that I have to come to terms with with them and they have to come to terms with with me. And I can't judge anybody. I've made tons of, tons of decisions that people don't agree with. Once we got past that initial little weird thing, and and I was and Jamie is still Jamie, and can yes, nothing about me changed as nothing me. Nothing about you ever changed about you. And and the further that I mean, it was you know, it was weird. It was weird for me too. It was aggressively weird. It was aggressive. No, <laughs> seriously. Now I couldn't. Now now I was essentially jumping without a parachute. Yeah, and, and there's pretending no turning I knew back. exactly how to land. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So, but the more that I, because you didn't initially reject me, and the more I got to feel this thing out on my own, and the more comfortable I got in my own skin and realized, yes, this is absolutely the right thing, the more that we got along. Like, the more progressed, the more friendly we got, the more smooth it got, like, there was a whole lot of, well, the cat's out of the bag. That's not even a thing we can think about anymore. Now I can just be a person in front of my mom and not this weird secret keeping, figuring stuff out. And isn't it that way with everything, though? The more honest that you are, transparent in your business, in your social life, in your personal, you know, personal life, your family life, it, it just makes it easier. It just makes it easier. There's no, there can be no judgment when it's all honest and and authentic, right? And authentic, yeah. You see a person for a person, not for like how they dress or you know put on their makeup or shoes they wear. Right, right. It's this interesting process too, right? Because when you think about when we think about coming out, we always think about the person who's coming out, but there's a process that's ha- happening at the same time, which is the finding out process. Yeah. Right? So the both of you are having this experience at the same time uh-huh. and kind of coming to center. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, that's it, what it is. It's progress and coming to center. Yeah. And, and it takes a while. It does. It, takes it can the, take a it, while. Well, it takes the work. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and not giving up. I mean, you know. That's the thing. My family is so important to me that no matter how deep my independent streak was or my sense of curtailing authority I was never not going to come around and I hope I didn't ever make it feel like I was forcing this uncomfortableness on you but it was more important to me to still be around the family I didn't take that that first bit of weirdness and go okay this is just not going to work I'm just going to be me by myself no no it you know yeah you had to swallow hard I know yeah but it was worth it because my family is like some of my favorite people in the world. My sisters are are my favorite people in the world. You are my favorite person in the world. I'm your favorite so- mom. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal's a close sec. <laughs> I, I consider that a high honor. I will be. I will be your second anytime. Yeah. <laughs> we are unfortunately uh, kind of. I mean, we're we're doing really well on time. Like we're we're nailing it. But before I say anything further. Um, because we have some, we have some food to make. Uh, <laughs> but a mom, right away, I I love you. I love you too. And I thank you so much for being my mom. And peaks and valleys aside, I I I can't tell you just how much you mean and how happy I am that this is what today looks like. 
I, I would hug you, but I don't, these don't come oh, off. No, and, no, you're going to run into the mic. I'm it's going to ruin the, the whole mark. show. It's going to ruin fired. everything, but I love you. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. And to officially wrap it up, because we do have an industry professional here, we've been ending the show the same way over the course of now 17 episodes. Um, three pieces of professional advice from your perspective that you give to any newcomer. I had to shift very quickly in my I head. Know. I know. We do a lot of gear changes to keep it under an hour. I was like trying to push my tears back. And you're like, what's the business advice? I was like, oh, no. Hug your mom. It's like, what's happening? I mean, the, the three pieces of advice. I think do not rush. Do your research. Um, research, research as much as you can. Um, I would say to reach out to other people. So look at other people that are doing the same work as you or just starting out. There are educational stuff there. Um, and even if it's informal and it's just community stuff, like it is very valuable. Um, I would say treat it like a business, which means that you you be metered and you don't, you know what I mean? You take care of yourself first because burnout is very high in our industry. And I think that if you treat it like a business, then it'll be easier for you to separate yourself out from it, which is really important. I think, I think, protecting like you as the person is so 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 important and often gets missed especially when you're using yourself as your brand and so i would i would instill that with people from the very beginning compartmentalize exactly compartmentalize your business is your business you are you are playing a character yeah, yeah exactly Treat, delayed gratification yes don't make it all about yourself if this is a business, make it about the customers. That'll mm -hmm. that'll put compartmentalization right on schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's and I think that the last part is build community. You know, um, seek support. So whether it's I, I I I participate, be proactive when there are events that you can network, do them. You know, even if you feel awkward, just talk to people. People are are, are oftentimes nicer than you anticipate. And if you need support, like see a therapist. You know, like really utilize those sources because. It's a lonely business, especially because the way things are now where everyone is an independent content creator, we're very separate. And so do the extra legwork to stay in connection to other people, treat it like a business and, and do your research and, and then do more research on top of that. I love it. All beautiful pieces of advice and the most advice. like, yes, and like the most salient pieces of advice are the pieces of advice we keep hearing time and time again. Repeated, yeah, absolutely. Do your research, treat it like a business. Absolutely. I believe you owe Stephen a favor. Oh, Look yeah. Right into that oh, camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, please pay me my salary. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to I'm going to promote a site really quick. It is a real it is it is a good deal so so know that like I do believe in it. I just want to make sure I give the information correctly so I don't lose my salary. Groovy owns and operates a bunch of membership sites. We also have a new site that came out called realtgirls.com. We want to license content from performers. Performers can keep and retain the, their rights, but then they get paid from us. And so it, it's something where you can make a little bit of money. You don't have to, there's no exclusivity, so you can still promote your content. Otherwise, wait, hold on. Okay, Stephen, don't fire me. I'm going to, I'm going to give the, I'm going to give the. I can, um, I can sing its praises because I've already taken part in it. I know exactly what it is. And for anybody, yes, please, if you're an independent uh, producer, do investigate realtygirls.com because it is, it's just licensing. Uh, you get to, that's going to be the most important selling point is that you can use your content however you want. They're just giving you a really nice taste of some money so that they can also use that content. Yes. And the other thing to remember, so one, it has to be a, a 4K hardcore scene. Um, the other thing, we want it to be full length, which is 20 to 40 minutes. Um, it will be logo free. So when you submit it to us, because we'll put our logos on there. And let's see, content that is only available on your site or fan sites and not legally available for free anywhere. And we want to make sure that when you submit to us that you have all the proper paperwork. 